victory for everyday Ohioans in, who have been suffering uh, under partisan gerrymandering since the 1970s. It's back to the drawing board for Ohio lawmakers and the clock is ticking to pass new district maps. And the U.S. Supreme Court blocks part of the Biden administration's vaccine mandate. What Ohio Attorney General Dave Yost has to say about the decision. And federal help is on the way for Ohio hospitals why doctors and nurses say they couldn't be more stressed. Thank you so much for joining us for Face the State. Today, I'm Tracy Townsend. This week, the Supreme Court of Ohio ruled the new redistricting maps for Ohio's House and Senate districts must be redrawn, and lawmakers only have a matter of days to do it. In a 4-3 to three decision, the court ruled the maps are invalid because they don't match voter preference. The map set the boundary lines for the 99 House seats and 33 Senate seats. They will be used for the 2022 elections. Still, the plaintiff in this case, the League of Women Voters, is happy with the ruling, but says the fight is not over yet. We're asking everyday Ohioans to call the commissioners and tell them what they want their map to look like. Uh, ask for fair maps. Um, and we will be at all those hearings. Um, and then if the map that is adopted is unfair, that's presented to the Ohio Supreme Court, we will work with our experts and legal team to make that case to the Ohio Supreme Court that that map still doesn't meet muster. We talked with Lieutenant Governor John Husted right before the decision came down. He said the state will comply with the decision. I was a close observer to what was happening. Uh, Governor and I really tried hard to bring the Democrats and Republicans together to come up with a bipartisan compromise. Uh, it, it, it proved at the 11th hour not to be possible. Governor Mike DeWine sent us a statement saying he will work with the commission on revised maps that are consistent with the court's order. 10 TV's Kevin Landers asked the governor about this issue at the end of last year. Congressional redistricting maps that you sign into law raises questions about whether you're really interested in what's better for the greater good of Ohio or, Ohio or just your party ma maintaining political control. As governor, what makes sense about these maps to you? Well, in regard to the State Legislative Act maps and in regard to the congressional maps, if you look at what was presented and you look at what the Constitution required, um, the maps that were presented by Republicans better complied with the Constitution. Things such as, you know, uh, cutting down on the number of counties that are split up uh, and other things in there. So if you look at that, that's, that's why, you know, I signed the bill, for example, in regard to the, the uh, congressional uh, seats. U.S. Senator Sherrod Brown referenced the state Supreme Court decision when he was talking about voting rights as a whole, an issue that was in the national spotlight this week. It's really important that Congress stand up for voting rights. I, I think what's happened is far too many politicians and a whole lot of them in Ohio have decided that that they should choose, politicians should choose their voters rather than voters choosing their elected officials. You saw the best example of that this week where a Republican Chief Justice of the Supreme Court said no to the arrogance of redistricting, of gerrymandering, said no to the arrogance of politicians who think they should choose their voters rather than voters choosing their elected officials. And um, that's why it's important nationally that we pass voter st voting standards so that politicians who don't mean well in these cases, who are all in search of more power, and that's not uncommon in this business and in this city, um, that, that, you know, that, that, that it's important that, that we, that, that voters get to choose their elected officials rather than the other way around. Congresswoman Joyce Beatty traveled to Georgia this week with President Biden to promote voting rights legislation, and she gave a passionate speech on the House floor, pushing for the Senate to move forward with the bills. 
I stand here today in support of the Freedom to Vote John R. Lewis Act of 2022 because black people representing the Congressional Black Caucus have stood in line, have been attacked by dogs, have put their lives on the line, crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge for us to have the right to vote. What's happening at a national level is also sparking conversations about Ohio's voting laws. 10 TV's Richard Solomon explains what lawmakers in our state are trying to accomplish. You can always learn a lesson, even in a place where you least expect to learn it. It's called a back in the day, something that people can always reflect back to. In Al Edmondson's barbershop, a cut above the rest in Columbus, all you have to do is look up. People took advantage of voting. There would have been lines of people waiting to go into the um, King Arts Complex. The message of using the 15th Amendment is something Edmondson preaches that roars louder than his clippers. He's helped numerous people in the community get registered to vote and get to the polls through the Styling for Democracy Now Vote program with the Ohio Secretary of State Office. We're preaching to the younger generation is that your vote does count. He's kept an eye on two key national voting rights bills the U.S. Senate is working to pass. One would update the 1965 Voting Rights Act and demand states with a history of discrimination to remove and change election laws. The other would require all 50 states to offer at least two weeks of early voting. Voting should be easy anyway. Anything that can help make the voting process for everybody, I'm for it. But House Bill 387 aims to change voting laws in Ohio. If passed, the bill would require voters to have a state-issued photo ID in order to vote. It would also eliminate no-excuse absentee voting and prohibit the use of ballot drop boxes. We reached out to some of the state representatives who sponsor and support the bill, but we haven't heard back. Mindy Hedges, a member of the League of Women Voters in Ohio, says so many have fought for the right to vote. She believes this bill could make that right harder. We have to allow everybody the opportunity to vote. And if you don't give them options to make it easier, then they give up. And giving up is not an option. For Emerson, he hopes to look at this mural one day and see it again in the community. It would represent how people knew that their vote counted, and they were willing to wait and wait and wait as long as they could. In Columbus, Richard Solomon, 10 TV News. The last action on House Bill 387 was back in September when it was referred to the House Government Oversight Committee. The U.S. Supreme Court partially struck down President Biden's federal COVID-19 vaccine or test mandate this week. Large businesses will not be required to mandate employees get vaccinated or tested weekly. However, the vaccine mandate for certain health care workers remains in place. Ohio Attorney General Dave Yost is one of many who filed a suit against the mandate. Yost says the ruling isn't exactly what he wanted, but he has to abide by it. The takeaway here is uh, that these are not political decisions. These are legal decisions that turned on the justice's best interpretation of the legal uh, questions presented to them. Ohio Chamber of Commerce President Steve Stivers says he's pleased with the decision. Well, we're excited that uh, businesses won't have to spend money complying with a, a requirement that may in a week or a month be determined to be unconstitutional. So uh, we think there should be certainty uh, about whether it applies or doesn't apply before people spend millions of dollars to start to comply with it. People on social media are claiming that two United States Supreme Court justices have spread misinformation about flu death rates and child COVID-19 hospitalizations. We called in our Verify team to help clear this up. Here's Ariana Daytil. Headlines and Reddit threads accused two Supreme Court justices of making false claims. The claims stemmed from when the justices were hearing oral arguments over Biden's vaccine mandate for federal workers and those employed at large companies. Some news outlets reported that transcripts of the hearings quote Justice Neil Gorsuch saying hundreds of thousands of people die from the flu every year and that Justice Sonia Sotomayor claimed 100,000 kids with COVID-19 are in serious condition. Several viewers emailed Verify requesting that we fact check those claims. Our sources are C-SPAN's recording of the oral argument, Supreme Court transcripts, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Department of Health and Human Services, and the American Academy of Pediatrics. 
Here's the audio snippet from Justice Gorsuch that people are referring to. We have flu vaccines. The flu kills, I believe, hundreds of thousands of people every year. In the Supreme Court's original oral argument transcript, Gorsuch is quoted as saying, we have flu vaccines. Flu kills, I believe, hundreds of thousands of people every year. However, the Supreme Court released a revised transcript a few days later. In that transcript, Gorsuch is quoted as saying, we have flu vaccines. The flu kills, I believe, hundreds, thousands of people every year. So we can verify, no. Justice Gorsuch did not claim that hundreds of thousands of people die from the flu each year. He said hundreds, thousands. So how many people actually die from the flu each year? Well, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the highest number of flu deaths in the last 10 years was during the 2017-2018 season, with an estimated 61,000 deaths. Viewers also asked us to look into claims that Justice Sonia Sotomayor said 100,000 kids with COVID-19 are in serious condition. Take a listen. We have over 100,000 children, which we've never had before, in, in serious condition and uh, many on ventilators. If a patient is in serious condition, they should be hospitalized. Johns Hopkins Medicine describes a patient in serious condition as being, quote, acutely ill with vital signs that may be unstable and not within normal limits, unquote. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, there are 580,000 new child COVID-19 cases reported as of last week. However, only a small fraction of them are serious cases. An average of 830 children ages 0 to 17 were admitted to the hospital every day during the week of January 2nd to the 8th of 2022, according to the CDC. Data from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services shows that as of January 10th, 2022, 4,661 children were hospitalized with suspected or laboratory confirmed COVID-19 cases. So we can verify Justice Sotomayor's claim is false. There are not 100,000 kids with COVID-19 in the U.S. in serious condition. With your verify, I'm Ariane Till. Have a claim you would like us to verify? Let us know. Email verify at 10tv.com. Still to come, how the state plans to use $115,000 to fight human trafficking, plus a disturbing discovery inside an Akron church. It's raising questions about Ohio's laws on cremains. We continue our coverage of the man accused of running an illegal funeral business in Ohio. The cremains of 89 people were discovered after the state filed a search warrant on an Akron church run by a Columbus man. 10 TV's Kevin Landers is following the Shante Harden case and explains what new charges Harden will face and why this is raising questions about our state's laws on cremains. These photos are from inside the Greater Faith Missionary Baptist Church in Akron where Shante Harden was once pastor. A woman who identified herself as an urban explorer took them and provided them to 10 TV. She says while she was taking photos of the vacant church, she noticed a door was open and went inside. Later, she told investigators she saw boxes of suspected cremated remains of people. Based on what she told investigators, a search warrant was filed and executed on Tuesday. Investigators discovered the cremains of 89 people. The state believes Harden committed the crime of abuse of corpse. I spoke with Harden's attorney about the cremains. He said they came from a prior funeral director who has since died, and Harden knew the cremains were inside when he took over the church. I think it would be different if he discovered them. When they're given to him, uh, I don't think he probably has a chain of title to them, but he was holding them for an acquaintance and didn't think too much about that. And I'm sure he didn't think they were going to be there six years later. Under Ohio law, there is no requirement for a funeral director to notify anyone about the unclaimed remains. There are no rules in Ohio that state where cremains can be stored. Funeral directors are not required to tell the state if they have cremains, according to the state's executive director of the Board of Embalmers and Funeral Directors. Generally speaking, I'd assume that there's going to be nobody showing up and it probably is time to put them in the ground. Investigators found the boxes of cremains placed in white cardboard boxes and plastic bags, and some of the boxes reflected dates back to 2010. The name Tri-County Cremation Service was on the boxes. The woman who discovered them tells 10TV she placed rosaries and flowers over the boxes of the cremains. 41-year-old Shante Harden of Columbus already faces 44 criminal charges out of Lucas County for operating an illegal funeral home, abuse of a corpse, and representing himself as a funeral director, among other charges. His attorney called the case against his client malicious prosecution. 
do you think that Shantae was portraying himself as someone he was not as it pertains to these funerals? If, if you're going to the issue is, was he telling people he was a licensed funeral director? Of course not. Do I think those people are lying? No. They come to Shanti at a terribly emotional time in their life. Their loved one has just died. And they, like most of us, don't know anything about the funeral business. And they assume and expected to hear that he was a funeral director and whatever he said, that's the way they interpret it. They're not lying. They're just confused. And again, that was 10 TV's Kevin Landers reporting. Now, under federal law, if a funeral home has unclaimed cremations of a veteran, the funeral home is supposed to call the Department of Veterans Affairs, where the remains are supposed to be buried at a veteran cemetery at no cost. We know of at least one of the remains found at that church was a member of the U.S. Air Force who died back in 2020. So-called John schools are coming to Ohio. Attorney General Dave Yost announced this week that $100,000 will go toward creating a guide for courts and communities to teach sex buyers the ugly truth about human trafficking. Sex buyers need to understand that they are the reason for the existence of the human trafficking market. We all know the rationalizations that perpetuate this sexual oppression. It's just a business transaction between a willing buyer and a willing seller. It's a quote unquote, victimless crime. She's participating voluntarily. It's just her job. Sex buyer education torpedoes those lies and shows the buyers of sex the ugly truth about the market that they encourage and support with their actions and their dollars. Forces them to look at the drug addiction, the violence, the child abuse, and the degradation that they're responsible for it. We lay it all at their feet. This comes after the passage of House Bill 431, which created legal sanctions aimed specifically at sex buyers, including stiffer fines and a requirement that offenders attend John School. Columbus Crew is getting ready for sports betting to go live in Ohio. The crew announced that it will partner with global sportsbook operator Tipico this is all pending license approval, but if it goes as planned, crew fans will be able to bet through the Tipico app when sports betting again goes live in our state. The governor signed sports betting into law late last month. As the Omicron variant of COVID-19 continues to spread through Ohio, more help is on the way for hospitals here. How the Biden administration is helping and the role you might be able to play in the solution. The state of Ohio is on a list of states to receive federal help to fight COVID. 10 TV's Brian Somerville explains why this is needed and what you can do to do your part. Good morning, everyone. Thursday morning, President Joe Biden announced six states, including Ohio, will be receiving federal help to alleviate record shattering hospitalizations due to COVID-19. This support will help them open closed beds and be able to accept more transfers. Ohio Department of Health Director Dr. Bruce Vanderhoff says a team of 20 U.S. Air Force medical professionals will arrive at the Cleveland Clinic next week, an appointment that could last a couple of months. Adding the extra staff, he says, will benefit the entire region, helping to supplement the efforts already in place by current staff, as well as the National Guard that Governor Mike DeWine requested last month. The biggest issue, the president says, those who are vaccinated tend to have mild to no symptoms at all, while the unvaccinated are 17 times more likely to get hospitalized. As a result, they're crowding our hospitals, leaving little room for anyone else who might have a heart attack or an injury in an automobile accident or any injury at all. Dr. Vanderhoff saying COVID has already claimed the lives of more than 30,000 Ohioans. He urges everyone to continue to take it seriously, to get vaccinated, and to wear masks. COVID-19 is not going away. And Omicron is not just a little cold for everyone. Bryant Somerville, 10 TV News. The other states getting help. Michigan, New York, New Jersey, Rhode Island, and New Mexico. As hospitals battle COVID cases, there is another battle brewing across the state and the country. 
We're talking racism and discrimination in health care. Leaders from across our state came together to address the issue. 10 TV's Brittany Bailey reveals what they discovered. COVID may be top of mind in hospitals across our state, but that may not be the only challenge. There's more than sufficient evidence to classify our health care systems, including our hospitals, as racist and demonstrate that racism has been intentionally institutionalized and continues to manifest in, dis in disparate and negative outcomes for marginalized populations in this country. Four groups, including Universal Health Care Action of Ohio, teamed up to survey more than 800 people about discrimination in health care. Over and over again, uh, most um, uh, though those in the community uh, suggested and even spoke to experiences that proved uh, reasons for distrust and a need to repair the breach. Uh, between uh, the hospital systems and the community um, and to establish a better pathway uh, of outreach, more than just symbolic or ceremonial, but substantive. In the survey, black people were more likely to report discrimination, a lack of respect, poorer service, and having symptoms dismissed. And the most common reactions were not returning for another appointment or accepting this treatment as a fact of life. This is saying what we've done for 30, 40, 50, 200 years has not worked. It's a crisis, and now it's time to put some momentum behind what we know to be true, and now we have proof of that. Now the goal is to spread these survey results far and wide and demand action. We're calling hospitals, we're calling the government, we're calling the city, the states, the local health departments to action, the, because this is what it's going to take. Someone has to take action, and it can't just be, oh, well, we did this little thing, and it's great. Mm -mm. We need millions of dollars behind this. We need hospitals to be held accountable. We need someone to put it in place where they can be held accountable for the things that have been brought to our attention. Brittany Bailey, 10 TV News. We have a link to a detailed breakdown of those survey results and how the data was collected posted with this story on the 10 TV app. You can get some help covering the cost of heating your home. Ohio is getting $367 million in home energy assistance money from the federal government. Most of that money is coming from the American Rescue Plan. You could qualify depending on your family income or if you've had COVID-19 in the last 12 months. State Representative Dontavius Geralds from Columbus says this is an important change from years past. We understand that with COVID, there's so many families who have had to miss work, uh, you know, or they have, they have a loved one who was sick and they had to stay home because they were in proximity of someone who had COVID. And so when we think about individuals who are uh, impacted by COVID, we wanted to make sure that, well, I would say the federal government wanted to make sure that we are providing assistance to those families who need it the most. There is a chart, actually, if you go to development.ohio.gov um, uh, with and you click on the HEAP uh, tab, you're, you, you'll get access to every uh, uh, breakdown of family unit, but also how much money are you going to receive and how to actually apply for this assistance. I encourage every person, every person who qualifies to please take advantage of this program. It is going to make a difference for you. It's gonna make a difference for your family. And we want every family to stay warm this winter. To find out if you are eligible, go to 10tv.com slash featured links. Thank you all for being here with us today. Remember, if it affects you and your family, we're here to make sure those accountable face the state.